IQ is largely a pseudo 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 scientific swindle. Pseudo scientific swindle. Dateline January first, two thousand nineteen, by my man uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And uh, this is part of his uh, medium.com on his inserto collection, which you can buy here. I'll put a link in the show notes. If you click on it, I get paid. Excellent. Uh, this is, if you want your mind bended, uh, this is what you need to read. If you're retired and you're like, I got to keep my mind active, read this stuff. Uh, Fool by Randomness, uh, Black Swan, The Bed of Procrustes, and Anti-Fragile. Just, it's it's insanely good. This is one of those books I try to listen to on uh on tape book on uh, audible but I, I just i can't i gotta sit there and think about it i'm not good at listening to books on audio all right wait let's read this um he talks with iq so let's go uh turns out iq beats random selection in the best of applications by less than six percent typically less than two percent as the co computation of correlations have a flaw and psychologists do not seem to know the informational value of correlation in terms of how much do I gain information about B by knowing A? Uh, uh, showing the story behind the effectiveness of the average national IQ is statistically a fraud. The psychologist who engaged me on this piece with verbose write-ups made the mistake of showing me the best they got. Papers with the strongest pro-IQ arguments. They do not seem to grasp what noise slash single really means in practice. I'm going to share with you a good write-up uh, a, a, a naysayer to Nassim's uh, article, article here, which is which is good, but it proves uh, it proves the, the theory absolutely that it's a fraud, or at least doesn't do what people have been taught it would be. All right, background: IQ is a stale test meant to measure mental capacity, but in fact mostly measures extreme unintelligence, learning difficulties, as well as to a second or lesser extent a form of intelligence stripped of second order effects. How good someone is at taking some type, of, some type of exams designed by unsophisticated nerds. It is viva negativa, not viva positiva, positiva. Designed for learning disabilities and given that is not too needed there, it ends up selecting for exam takers, paper shufflers, obedient intellectual yet idiots, ill-adapted for real life. The fact that it correlates with general incompetence makes the overall correlation look high even when it is random. The concept is poorly thought out mathematically by the field. It commits a severe flaw in correlation under fat tails and asymmetries, fails to properly deal with dimensionality, and treats the mind as an instrument, not a complex system, and is promoted by racist eugenists. People bent on showing that some populations have inferior mental abilities based on IQ tests. Again, they're saying it measures intelligence. Those have been upset with me for suddenly robbing them of a scientific tool as evidenced by the bitter reactions to the initial post on Twitter by such people as Charles Murray. And I'm not a, I'm not a uh, anti Charles Murray guy. I just I've always thought the whole thing, even before I knew in this uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb about the bell curve. Some populations are smarter than other. I just I, look as a Christian, just, that doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense at all, uh, especially when we know that Jesus came from the Middle East. Uh, so. Uh, if you're a Christian, you think that whites are inherently superior than blacks because of intelligence quotient. quotient. Uh, I, I, look, man, I just I find that to be I, I absolutely I find it to be nuts. Um, it's just weird because well, where's Jesus? He's Middle Eastern. He's definitely not white. He's definitely not black. He's middle of the road. So does that mean the whole thing kind of creeps me out? Uh, something observed by the great Karl Popper: psychologists have a tendency to pathologize pathologize people who bust them by tagging them with some type of disorder. They say they're childish or narcissistic or egomaniac or something similar. Anyway, it's uh, uh, psychometrics peddlers looking for suckers, military, large corporations to buy into. This is the best measure in psychology argument when it's not technically a measure. It explains that best between 2 and 13% in the performance of thus of some tasks. Those tasks that are similar to the test itself. Uh, minus the data massaging and statistical cherry picking by psychologists, it doesn't even satisfy the monoticity and transitivity required to have a measure. No measure that fails 80 to 95% of the time should be part of science, nor should psychology owning to a sinister track record be part of science anyway. All right, I want to share with you actually um, 
Listen, actually, hold on. I will share my story. Is at the bottom an immoral measure that, while not working, can put people and worse groups in boxes for the rest of their life. I could not agree more. There is no statistical association between high IQ between IQ and hard measures such as wealth. Most achievements linked to IQ are circular stuff, bureaucratic or academic success, things for test takers and salary earners, and structured jobs that resemble the test. Wealth may not mean success, but is the only hard number, not some discrete score of achievements. You can buy food with a $30, not with other success, rank social prominence, or having a selfie with a queen. Psychologists do not realize that the effect of IQ, if any, ignoring circularity, is smaller than the difference between IQ tests for the same individual. Correlation is 80% tests and retests, meaning if you begin, meaning you being Meaning you being you explains less than 64% of your results. So you hear that? The correlation between IQ tests for the same individual is 80% between tests and retests. Meaning that you being you explains 64% of your test results. Some argue that IQ measures intellectual capacity. Real world results uh, come from, in addition, wisdom or patience, conscient conscientiousness, decision making or something of the sort. No. It does not even measure intellectual capacity, mental powers. If you want to detect how someone fares at a task, say loan sharking, tennis playing, random matrix theory, make him or him do that task. We don't need theoretical exams for real world function by probability challenge psychologists. Traders get it right away. Hypothetical profit, profit and loss from simulated paper strategies don't count. Performance equals real world actual. What goes in people's heads as a reaction to an image on a screen doesn't exist, except via negativa. If IQ is Gaussian by construct, well, almost, and if real-world performance were net, fat-tailed, it is, then either the covariance between IQ and performance doesn't exist or is uninformational. It will show a finite number in a sample, but doesn't exist statistically. And the metrics will overstate, overestimate the predictability. Another problem, when they say black people are X standard, de de standard deviations away, they don't know what they're talking about. Different populations have different variances, even different skewness, and these comparisons require richer models. There are severe mathematical flaws. A billion papers in psychometrics wouldn't count if you have a flaw. <sighs> but, the I but the intelligence and IQ is determined by academic psychologists. No geniuses, like the paper trading we mentioned above. Via statistical constructs, correlation that I show, and he shows a couple of figures, that they patently don't understand. It does correlate to very negative performance as it was initialized, initially designed to detect learning special needs. But then any measure would work there. A measure that works in the left tail, not the right tail, is problematic. We have got similar results since the famous Terman longitudinal study, even massage data for later studies. To get to the point, consider that if someone has mental needs, there will be a 100% correlation between performance and IQ tests. But the performance doesn't correlate as well at higher levels. Though unaware of the effect of nonlinearity, the psychologists think it does. The statistical spin as a marking argument is that the person with an IQ of 70 cannot prove theorems, which is obvious for a measure of unintelligence. But they fail to reveal how many IQs of 150 are doing menial jobs. So they... A low IQ may provide information, while very high IQ may convey, convey nothing better than random. It's not even a necessary uh, uh, thing. All right, so let me, uh, I think there's one more example. All right, it is a false comparison to claim that IQ measures the hardware rather than the software. It measures some arbitrarily selected menial abilities in a testing environment believed to be useful. However, if you take the Popperian Hayekian view, on intelligence, you would realize that to measure future, that to measure future needs, it it you that the, you would realize that to measure future needs, you would need to know the mental skills needed in a future ecology. Oh, I could not agree with that more. To measure future needs of someone who can be productive, you need to know the mental skills needed in that future ecology, which requires predictability of said future ecology. It also requires some ergo ergosity the skills to make it to the future, hence the need for mental biases for survival. Example, you're designing a car for performance. A Maserati will perform best on a track and beat a goat there. But what if you need to cross a Corsican garage? A goat will be ideal then. In New York City, during traffic, pedestrians beat cars. So the notion of performance need to be associated with a specific environment and necessarily predictive of it. Footnote, 
Herb Simon's notion of scissors. One blade represents capabilities, the other blade the situational context. The G, because of his mathematical flaws, fails to produce a general solution to this. And he's got a pitch. <laughs> Mensa members, typically high IQ losers in Birkenstocks and socks. Yeah, man, 100%. Um, in real life, in academia, there's no difference between academia and the real world. In the real world, there is. When someone asks you a question in the real world, uh, you focus first on why is he asking me that, which shifts you to the environment and detracts you from the problem at hand. Philosophers has known about the problem forever. Only suckers don't have that instinct. Further, take the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, X. What should X be? Only someone who is clueless about induction would answer 5 as if that were the only answer. We can apply here Wittgenstein's rule-following problem, which states that any of the infinite number of functions is compatible with a finite sequence. Um, not only clueless, but obedient enough to want to think in a certain way. Real life never offers crisp questions with crisp answers. Most questions don't have answers. Perhaps the worst problem with IQ is that it seems to select for people who don't like to say there is no answer, don't waste time, find something else. It takes a certain type of person to waste intelligence concentration on classroom academic problems. These are lifeless bureaucrats who can muster sterile motivation. Some people can focus on problems that are real, not fictional textbook ones. IQ doesn't detect convexity of mistakes. Uh, to do well, you must survive. Survival requires some mental biases directing uh, to some errors. Fooled by randomness shows... Uh, seeing shallow patterns is not a virtue, at least a naive interventionism. Some, some psychological psychologists wrote back to me, IQ selects for pattern recognition essential for functioning in modern society. No, not seeing patterns except when they are significant is a virtue in real life. To do well in life, you need depth and ability to select your own problems and to think independently. And one has to be a lunatic or a psychologist to believe that a standardized test will reveal independent thinking. National IQ is a fraud. So I'll let you read that. Um, I just want to point out real quick, when I was, uh, let's see, I was probably seven, uh, 1997, I graduated, was it 97, 98, I had graduated from college, I think it was an, I, I, I took the LSAT, so the, I forgot, law school application, aptitude test or something like that, and in 1997 or 1998, I took, I got a 153, I didn't really study, I just, I didn't care, I was just like, well, we'll take it, just, uh, I don't know, it seemed like what people are doing when they graduate, they didn't really, what else? I didn't want to take the GMAT because you know, MBA never had any appeal to me. Is that the GMAT? I forgot. But anyway, so I moved to Phoenix a couple years later. And I said, you know, maybe I do want to go to law school because, you know, when you're not happy, uh, what do people do? They go to law school because they're like, maybe being a lawyer will make me rich and famous and happy. And all the fraud of law schools, uh, you've got these books on the Princeton Review or whatever it's called. If you could, the average person who graduates from freaking Joe Schmo Law School makes 85000 a year. The whole thing is fraud. Complete, complete, complete fraud. I don't know how the law schools avoided. They, they were sued and, they, and the, 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 the plaintiffs lost, which is nuts. Uh, I don't know how that, because it's all fraud. But anyway, so I took it again, but this time I actually studied. And remember, this is just a test to determine your aptitude for being a lawyer. Now, I have no idea that apparently there's some correlation there. This is not a test that determine your intelligence quotient. But the problem is with a test is that it is a sterile environment with people who are good at test taking. All right. And that's the problem that we have with these tests. So let me. So I had studied. I was ready to rock and roll. I was ready to go. I, this time I studied. I, uh, I, I was ready to go. And I was shooting for 160. My brother had taken the LSAT. He got like a 171 or something like that just because he's good at that. He's, the logic stuff, it just it, it fits him, man. On a test-taking environment, he's just good at this. Um, what do you get on the, on the SAT? I, but anyway, but like Maddie, she's just good at this. My daughter, my oldest, just good at test-taking. Doesn't mean they're smart or anything. Doesn't mean they're stupid. So it just means they're good at that function in life. Well, anyway, so the second time I was taking it, um, I, was, I was cruising for it. And uh, what you do on the LSAT is you take, you, you take the questions you have to knock those out and then you go back and i didn't know this the first time i was taking it so basically you take the easy questions and then the stuff that's hard you go back and so there's about eight minutes left or something like that and i'm now back on my hard questions so i've blown through i have like three sections left because they divide it up into like word problem segments and each word problem has like six questions to it so each word problem segment is very very valuable and if, if the funny thing is once you figure out the construct of that segment, you can blow through those six questions. You see what I'm saying? If you can't figure out the construct 
of the segment, you're not going to get any of the six right. So it's like once you kind of get a grab, like, ah, I get it. And the, the, the light bulb goes up. You're like, oh, boom, boom. You can just check them off. And then, you, you I mean, it's like, it's a great feeling. You're like, oh, I got it. Dun, dun, dun. So anyway, so I'm sitting there. I'm like, all right. Let me get the LSAT. I mean, let me uh, think this through. I think I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and the time's good. I'm like, okay, no, I got it. I'm, I'm confident. I got it. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, bing! And the, the bell went off to stop the test. And everyone's like, what the hell? You know, looking at your car, he said, we got eight minutes left. And the proctor, some old guy, said, oh, the time to put, put your pens down, or whatever, pencils down, and the test is done. And we're all like, looking at each other, like, huh? And we're all, no, we still got eight minutes. He goes, no, it's tough. So I put the, I set the clock. We're like, dude, you freaking idiot. We got eight minutes left. So we argued with this guy for like three minutes or something like that. Finally, he said, he's, oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, sorry, go back to take it. I will never forget that because I'm sitting there thinking I could not. I was in the groove. You know what I'm saying? You're in the zone. I'm like, okay, I got it. I got it. And bang. You're like, what? what? And then I couldn't get back to where I was. And I couldn't. I just, at that point, I was so freaking pissed off. I was like. You know, I had five minutes left or whatever, three minutes left, and I just, I, I couldn't get back so bad. And anyway, so I got a 157, but if I could have got, you know, one or two of those sections right, which I think I could have, I, I think I would have hit my goal of 160. And you can calculate what you need. I mean, it's very interesting to find out. Uh, you can do all the numbers. I forgot how it works. But you can calculate if you would have got those six questions right, what your score would have been. And I was like, I was so mad. And I said, okay. Um, and 157 is not bad. It's not, I wanted 160. And 157 was good enough. I, mean, I got a bunch of schools. I got a bunch of money from some of these schools. Not like University of Maine offered me money, I think like half or something like that. And, and some other schools did too, but it wasn't enough. And I was like, yeah. Ultimately, it worked out because I didn't go to law school, thankfully. But the point was on the IQ test, it's, a, it's, it's designed by test taking superior people for people who are good at taking tests. You're going to use that to determine intelligence? Actually, so it just doesn't make sense because what was the, I mean, what if you're getting freaking rained on? You know, what if there's a fireman behind you? What, what if a guy, the proctor tells you got eight minutes left or three minutes left when you got eight minutes? I mean, what if, what if, what if? What if you're just not that good at taking tests? What if you have dyslexia? What if you don't read English as a first language? What if, what if, what if? I mean, this is what I'm saying. It's stupid. All right, so let me go back to a, um, I want to show you, so we're not, he, you should read this. I think it's pretty interesting. Oh, bias and research. If a psychologist, psychological show, MDs and academics tend to have a higher IQ that is slightly informative, higher, but still noisy. It is largely because to get into schools, you need to score on a test similar to the IQ, just like I talked about. <laughs> the, the, the academics need to be good in which to be uh, better in academic fields on that certain test in which to go to academic you know, superiority. The mere presence of such a filter increases the visible mean and the lower visible variance. Probability and statistics confuse fools. If you rene rename the IQ from intelligent quotient to functionary quotient or salary person quotient, then some of the stuff will be true. It measures the best uh, the best ability to be a good slave can find a linear tasks. If someone came up with a numerical well-being quotient or sleep quotient trying to mimic temperature or physical quantity, you'd find it absurd. But put enough academics with physics, envy, and race hatred on it, and it would become an official measure. If it's, uh, we are talking about it. There is a severe non-linearity in the correlation retest, uh, test retest. In addition to the problem of interest sensitivity of correlation discussed in the technical note, uh, imagine a chronometer, a chronometer meter that varies by one hour per measurement. Yeah, that's, uh, I missed something obviously, but all right. So let's keep going. I want to show you um, one of the guys who wrote about, uh, he, I mean, you can read, this is just fascinating, but I want to show you one of the, the naysayers because he writes a good thing, but it just proves what this guy is saying. It proves. There's so many, this is this guy, Bruno Campanella de Souza. IQ is not a measure of unintelligence, extreme or otherwise. It's a comparative measure of the ability to solve abstract linguistic and logical mathematical problems. The results show how far each individual is from the average, both in terms of being above or below it. That does not, in my opinion, that does not measure intelligence. It simply does not. Uh, usefulness, reliability, and convenience and praxis have made IQ synonymous with intelligence in the scientific community. Though there are myriad of other capacities involved in the use of the mind, creativity, sociability, leadership, common sense, and self-regulation, which some might consider to comprise intelligence, they are usually referred to as abilities or competences. 
is really just a matter of labels which chooses to use. So again, this guy who's trying to prove that I, that Nassim is wrong is saying exactly what he's saying. It is it's, it might be a measure of your ability to solve abstract linguistic and logical math battle problems in the confined space of a testing mechanism, though. You see what I'm saying? Ah, jeez, Louise. But Josh, all the smart people in college have high IQs because they did well on tests. Exactly. Exactly. The IQ and the test taking capability are going hand in hand. So if you're not good at test taking, inherently you're not going to be good at IQ, which inherently means you don't have a good intelligence. That really makes no sense. Uh, the observation that IQ explains only 13 to 50 percent of the variance in some tasks, or even a maximum of 17 percent, and that's again the, the, merely reflects the fact that performance requires more than just intelligence. I would actually say intelligence in what regard? Because by measured on the IQ test? Yes, such things include conscientiousness, uh, patience, but also values, personality. By the way, all these things relate to social, 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 cultural settings, even physical environment. Actually, one should suspect a quack when someone in human or social sciences claims that a single variable alone explains most of the variance of anything. Indeed, the most advanced multivariate statistics in, in use today were created by psychologists and social sciences in order to deal effect with such complex complex problems that are few. All right, the field. I, I just I don't care. So the whole point is this guy is trying to show that Nassim Nicholas Taleb is right by actually proving that he was wrong by proving he's right by saying IQ is is one small section of the uh, of intelligence measurement. But he doesn't want to say it because all these guys, like the Phillips curve in economics, they've all thrown in like this is the proof that we need. I have a high IQ, thus I'm intelligent. I'm intelligent. Why? Because I have ability to take a test. Sad man. Anyway, read the book, get his stuff. Uh, I tell you, you might not agree with it. That's fine. Um, but it, it will make you think. And that's, I just love thinking for sure. All right, we'll see you.